We all know about the space race, how Russia got a head start, and then the Americans beat them to the moon. But how did the Russians plan on going to the moon in the first place? Well, that's the topic of today's video. In the early 60s, Nikita Khrushchev wanted to put a Soviet on the moon before those pesky Americans. So he formed two teams, one led by Sergei Korolev and the other by Vladimir Chelome. These teams were tasked with designing a rocket and a spacecraft that could land on the moon, and a smaller circumlunar spacecraft that could orbit the moon before any landing attempts. I'll hire your son if you pick my rocket. Hey! So Chelome designed the LK-1 for his manned circumlunar spacecraft. This spacecraft really resembled the Apollo CSM, although it was a lot smaller, only carrying two crew. The main spacecraft could generate power and do some small maneuvers, but it couldn't get to the moon on its own. It was mounted on the back of the RB translunar injection stage that would ignite in low Earth orbit and take it all the way to the moon. But how would this spacecraft launch in the first place? Well, Chelomey proposed the use of his UR-500 rocket, which was a part of the UR rocket family, UR standing for Universal Rocket. The UR-500 eventually became known as the Proton we know and love today. There were a couple uncrewed test flights. These were all labeled Cosmos satellites, as per usual for anything the Soviets didn't want you to know about. Korolev also designed a spacecraft, dubbed the Soyuz 7K-11, or more simply, Zond. Not that Zond, the other Zond. As its name implies, it was essentially just a Soyuz without the orbital module to save weight, and just like the LK-1, Zond would have its own boost stage that would take it to cislunar space. This boost stage was called Block D, remember it, it'll be important later. Zond would also be launched on the UR-500 just like the LK-1, and their mission profiles were almost identical. There were some test flights, the first one successfully got into an elliptical high Earth orbit. Then the three following missions had their own varying degrees of failure. Zond 4 almost succeeded, but the self-destruct system automatically destroyed it when it went off course during re-entry. Zond 5 was planned to carry crew, but after two missions failed after Zond 4, they decided to swap out the crew with a pair of tortoises, some flies, and bacteria, and they managed to safely bring them back to Earth. I mean, circumlunar flights are cool and all, but the main goal of this program was to get a Soviet on the moon. Let's talk about how they planned to do that. Starting with Chelomey's plan. He proposed a lander derived from his LK-1 spacecraft. This new LK-700 would add a descent stage with landing legs, a booster stage, and three other booster stages strapped to the first one. This larger spacecraft would far exceed the payload capacity of the UR-500, and they would need a much larger rocket. Behold, the UR-700. The UR-700 was essentially just an amalgamation of smaller rockets. The core stage consisted of three long tanks, each with an engine. Around this were six side boosters, these boosters would feed fuel into each other, then separate, then feed into the core stage, and separate again. This would leave the core stage fully fueled once the boosters were all used up. Many of the Kerbals in my audience would recognize this as asparagus staging, which is a lot easier in KSB than in real life. In fact, I think this is the only rocket that ever used asparagus staging, although I don't think it counts since it never flew, but I digress. Above this core stage was the second stage, which had what looked like boosters, but they were just fuel tanks that didn't separate, similar to Proton. Above this would be the LK-700 spacecraft, shrouded under a fairing with a nice little launch escape tower to top it all off. This rocket was very interestingly designed. I'm sure glad there wasn't another universal rocket concept with an even bigger number. Dude, these rockets suck. Back to the LK-700, once it was in low Earth orbit, the three side boosters would ignite to perform the translunar injection, then once at the moon, the main booster would perform the lunar capture burn and the power descent initiation. When the lander got near the surface, the main booster would detach and the spacecraft's landing legs would deploy as the descent engines ignite for a soft touchdown on the moon. Once all the lunar stuff was done, the ascent stage, which was essentially just the LK-1 spacecraft, would lift off the moon and go straight to Earth. The competitor for the UR-700 was the N1L3 rocket. It was designed by Sergei Korolev and Valentin Glushko. These two could not stand each other. Glushko hated Korolev because he thought Korolev was stupid and shouldn't even be a part of this program. Korolev hated Glushko because he had him sent to the Gulag many years prior, surely the best and brightest the Soviet Union had to offer. Their spacecraft was called the L3. It was split into three parts the LOK Soyuz, the LK Lander, and the Block D from earlier. You might be a bit confused why all these spacecraft are called LK. I know I was. 
but it just stands for lunar craft or anyways this spacecraft would be mounted on the block g booster stage which would complete the translunar injection once at the moon the block d stage would fire up to complete the capture burn then a cosmonaut would eva their way from the orbital module to the lk lander since there was no docking tunnel on the lk once they were ready to land the LK and Block D would separate and use the Block D's engines to slow down most of the way to the surface, right before jettisoning the Block D stage and having the LK land under its own power. Right before touchdown, some retro rockets would fire to make sure that it didn't flip during a rough landing. The LK lander itself was comprised of two stages, the descent stage and the ascent stage. The descent stage was essentially just a metal frame with landing legs, having no fuel tanks or engines. Those were on the ascent stage, which made up a majority of the lander. Once they were on the moon, the ascent stage would ascend and rendezvous with the LOK Soyuz in lunar orbit. Again, there was no docking tunnel, so they would have to EVA their way back to the LOK and manually transfer any samples they wanted to bring back. Then the LOK would take the crew safely back to Earth. Now let's talk about the rocket that would make this all possible, the N-1. The N-1 was the Soviet Union's equivalent of the Saturn V. It was a massive super heavy lift vehicle originally designed to launch massive space stations, military spacecraft, and even potential Mars missions. Even though these plans were extremely unrealistic, they still deemed it better than Chalmay's plan and decided to go with it. This rocket had three main stages to reach Earth orbit, then a fourth stage which was the Block G we talked about earlier. The three main stages all did something called hot staging, where the engines ignite before the stage separation, to prevent the fuel from sloshing around with zero gravity. Speaking of fuel, that was another point of contention between Korolev and Glushko. You see, Glushko wanted the engines to run on hypergolic propellants, since it would be easier to store and light the engines. Korolev wanted the engines to use kerosene, which is what the N1 rocket ended up using. Korolev argued that kerosene would be... Korolev? Korolev? Uh, somebody go check on him. Okay, okay, uh, cut the camera. The death of Sergei Korolev was a major setback for this program. He was replaced with Vasily Mishin, who is best remembered for his incompetence. I mean, the beginning of his Wikipedia article literally says he was best remembered for his failures in the Soviet space program that took place under his management. I mean, he did inherit an underfunded and problematic program, so it probably wasn't completely his fault, but they did have to blame someone. Wow, I sure am confused by this mission profile. If only someone made a somewhat comprehensive, kinder realistic 3D animation in Blender to explain what's happening. That was pretty cool, huh? So, how did this rocket do in testing? Well, the first test flight happened on February 21st, 1969, but shortly after liftoff, some engines started to fail, then some extreme vibrations caused a fuel leak, and it eventually crashed a few kilometers away from the launch site. The second test flight happened on July 3rd, only two weeks before Apollo 11. The first few seconds went fine, but suddenly, 29 of the 30 engines failed, and the massive N1 came crumpling down and absolutely destroyed the launch pad. It took them one and a half years to rebuild it, and by now the Americans had already landed on the moon a couple times, but the Soviets kept trying. The third test flight spun wildly out of control, and the fourth test flight was the most successful of the bunch almost making it to stage separation. But then some fuel lines exploded and sent the rocket once again tumbling down to the ground. The failure of this mission ended up canceling the program for good. But why did this program fail? Long story short, lack of money. Long story long, the constant fighting between Korolev and Glushko really set them back. 
along with the eventual death of Korolev and his incompetent replacement. Also, the Soviet Union was too caught up in foreign affairs and wasn't able to focus on spaceflight. And I would say that this is a good place to end off the video. If you made it this far, please consider subscribing. These videos take so long to make and I would really appreciate the support. And with that, stay tuned for next video.